Good morning. Today is Sunday, January 17th, 2021. In light of all that's going on in our society today, I thought about a message that is going to be just a little bit surprising in its context. I've entitled it, Do We Understand the Message? And my text is going to be from Mark chapter 11, the first 10 verses. Let me read it for you. As they approached Jerusalem and came to Bethphage and Bethany at the Mount of Olives, Jesus sent two of his disciples, saying to them, Go to the village ahead of you, and just as you enter it, you will find a colt tied there which no one has ever ridden. Untie it and bring it here. If anyone asks you why are you doing this, tell him the Lord needs it and will send it back here shortly. They went and found the colt outside in the street, tied at a doorway. As they untied it, some people standing there asked, What are you doing untying that colt? They answered as Jesus had told them to, and the people let them go. When they brought the colt to Jesus and threw their cloaks over it, he sat on it. Many people spread their cloaks on the road, while others spread branches they had cut in the fields. Those who went ahead and those who followed shouted, Hosanna! Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the coming kingdom of our father David. Hosanna in the highest. Now your minds are probably wondering right now, isn't, isn't this a Palm Sunday passage? And the answer to that is certainly yes. But today I'm interested in exploring a theme from that event that is still absolutely true today, especially in this confused, angry time. Our text draws our attention to the repeated blindness, the persistent deafness, the out and out inability of the disciples to recognize who Jesus really is and what he has come to the world to do. They've wanted to make him a king, and then they've wanted the seat of power right beside him. And when Jesus fed the 5,000, they didn't really understand. When he calmed the storm, they didn't recognize him. When he asked them straight out, who do you say that I am? They had the right answers and said the right words, but they had a completely different perception of who Jesus would be. They expected power and prestige. They wanted war and weapons. Here is Jesus in the Gospel of Mark revealing himself and God's plan for the world. And over and over and over again, the disciples and the crowds fail to grasp the revelation. It is a frustrating chain of events. Jesus proceeds to tell his disciples that, yes, he is the Messiah, but that doesn't mean what they think it means. What it means is that he's headed to Jerusalem to die and to suffer and to give his life as a ransom for many. Have you ever been in a conversation with somebody where you, you felt like you were just talking past each other? You know what I mean? It's, it's, it's like you're saying something, but they're hearing something else altogether. And then they, something, they say something, but you really don't understand the context and it doesn't mean anything. Finally, have you ever just gotten to the place where you said, do you want me to draw you a picture? Well, I think Jesus was to that point. I think Jesus felt like he had done all he could do. He had healed the sick. He had caused the blind to see. He had fed the hungry multitudes. He had touched lepers. He had cast out demons. Isn't that what the Messiah was to be about? Healing? restoration and deliverance 
And yet the disciples and the crowds had their eyes set, looking for a warrior, a rebel, somebody who would lead the revolt against Rome. I think Jesus, that day outside the city of Jerusalem, had gotten to the point where he just wanted to say, do you want me to draw a picture of why I'm here? And that's what he did. We do it today. When words aren't enough, we send flowers or a card. We convey messages, don't we, by the way we walk, the way we hold ourselves, the way we talk, the way we dress. Clothing, actions, visible ways of delivering a certain message. It's an age-old practice. In fact, it happened even in the Old Testament. You might call them dramatic sermons. There's a great one in the book of 1 Kings chapter 11. Listen to what it says. About that time, Jeroboam, he's a young leader in the nation of Israel, and Abijah, the prophet of Shiloh, met on the way. And Abijah was wearing a new cloak. The two of them were alone out in the country, and Abijah took hold of the new cloak he was wearing and tore it into twelve pieces. Then he said to Jeroboam, Take ten pieces for yourself, for this is what the Lord, the God of Israel, says. See, I am going to tear the kingdom out of Solomon's hand and give you ten tribes. The nation of Israel was going to be torn apart by dissension and by division. The twelve tribes of the nation were visually represented by the fragmented pieces of the prophet's coat. It was a visible message to Jeroboam. It happens again later in the life of the prophet Hosea. The people of Israel had again forsaken God. They had been spiritually unfaithful. And to make that dramatic and visible to them, God told the prophet Hosea to go out and marry a prostitute and show them what they had done by serving other gods. It was a visible message to the people. Jesus himself took up this ancient method, method, this common practice, the visible dramatic sermon, and he put it to his own use. Over and over again in the book of Mark, he had tried to tell them, and apparently he could have told them until he was blue in the face. Now it was time to draw them a picture. And so dramatically, visibly, and clearly, Jesus arranged for the words of the prophet Zechariah to be fulfilled. Zechariah, many years before, had said, Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion! Shout, daughter of Jerusalem! See, your king comes to you, righteous and having salvation, gentle and riding on a donkey, on a colt, on the foal of a donkey. It was a dramatic sermon. It was a visible message. It was Jesus drawing for them a picture of why he had come into the world. We have trouble with that picture, partly because, well, donkeys have an image problem in our culture. They're, they're thought to be dumb. None of our great Western heroes ever rode a donkey. John Wayne wouldn't, wouldn't have been caught dead on a donkey. The Lone Ranger, Zorro, they wouldn't ride on a donkey. The only person in our culture who ever rode a donkey was Festus from Gunsmoke. But we can't call him a hero. For us, a donkey is dumb and stubborn. But in the first century, donkeys were vital, useful, even noble animals. There are a lot of rocks in the Holy Land. 
in Palestine. They're everywhere. It's a rocky place. There are hills and valleys, narrow passes. There are winding, treacherous, rocky paths. And just like those excursions that we take sometimes to the bottom of the Grand Canyon, the beast of choice is not a horse. It's a donkey or a mule of some kind. In Palestine in the first century, donkeys were useful and vital, and they were also symbolic, a, a symbol of peace. If you want to go to war, ride a horse. If you're going into battle, you jump on the back of that stallion. But if you wanted to convey peace, you chose a donkey or the colt of a donkey. You see what Jesus is doing here? He's coming to Jerusalem, yes. He's coming as the Messiah, the, the promised deliverer from God, but he's also coming humbly and meekly and in peace. That was not what the people expected. They wanted their enemies to be destroyed. They wanted their oppressors to be overthrown. They wanted those Romans to go back, go back home to Rome. They wanted death and destruction to their foes and the Messiah. He was supposed to bring that to them. So they shouted, Hosanna, which in the Hebrew means save us. They shouted, Hosanna, take your sword and free us from Rome. Hosanna, crush our enemies. Hosanna, ascend your throne. Would you believe they even misunderstood the picture that Jesus drew? Had Jesus come to save them? Yes. Would he do it by spilling the blood of the Roman army? No. Their deliverance, their salvation, their freedom would come not from the spilling of Roman blood, but through the spilling of the Messiah's blood. The story of Jesus' entry into Jerusalem is just one more story of misunderstanding and blindness. It's a story of people stubbornly holding on to their own ideas, their own way, their own plans. They cannot see another way rather than seeing and submitting to God's plan. How often have we joined the cry of the crowd and asked Jesus to destroy our enemies? We often demand salvation from our pain, from our illnesses, from our problems, from our circumstances. We want our political rivals to be overthrown. We want our situations to be corrected. Save us, we say. And there's Jesus, continuing his journey in silence on an animal of peace toward Jerusalem and across of suffering. I take comfort sometimes in the fact that Jesus preached odd sermons. Here he is preaching without even using words. He is miming the message while the crowds are shouting and waving palm branches and lining the road with their coats. And what does Jesus do? He rides on in silence. He never said a word. He had tried words and the crowds had misunderstood. Now he tries symbolism and a visual image. And still, they don't get it. I think Jesus knew for certain, maybe now more clearly than he had ever known before, there was only one way for his disciples and the crowds to understand. He had not come to deliver them completely from suffering and pain or sacrifice. No, 
He had come to deliver the death blow to sin and hell and the grave in the midst of suffering, in the middle of pain and insufficiency. Jesus had come to provide grace and strength and glory. He had to paint them another picture. This time, it would be on a dark black canvas. And it would be near a hill that had the face of a skull on it. There would be two broad strokes one between heaven and earth and the other across the world. And at the cross section of those two strokes would be the blood-soaked face of the Son of God. Don't be deceived. Jesus came to fight a battle. He came to wage a war, but it wasn't a political value. It wasn't a political battle. It was a battle with the principalities and powers of the air and of darkness and of the sin of the entire world and this age. And his weapon was a cross of love and sacrifice. Jesus on the cross settled the outcome. He won the battle. The results are in. Jesus is the victor. Now the question is, do you know him as Savior today? Would you pray with me? Lord God, we have so many confused ideas about who you are and why you came. Some have named you a great teacher. Some have named you a, a world leader. Some have just said you were a deranged teacher and lost your life because of it. Some believe that if they can just do well enough on their own, that you will love them and bring them into heaven. They don't realize that you came to win the battle. And it's only through that victory that we can be saved. It's only through the salvation that you bring, not through our own efforts, but through your grace, that we can become a child of God and spend eternity with you. Lord, would you help us to set aside these worldly views that we have and really listen to what you have said to us? For God so loved the world that he sent his one and only son that whoever believes on him should not perish but have eternal life. Forgive us from our sin and accept us Save us and bring us into your family. In the name of Jesus, I pray. Amen. God bless you. Have a great week.